A pastor is not supposed to have favorites in a congregation. But I must confess that I do have favorites. And there are two groups in the church that I'm particularly drawn to. The first one is seniors. I love seniors because uh, many, if not most, of seniors have an understanding by the time they reach their senior years of what life is supposed to be all about. They've gotten out of the rat race largely. They've refocused themselves and their faith, having been tried and tested through many crises in life, shines brightly. The other group I love are teens and young adults. And I love them because of their idealism, their desire to change the world, their hopes, their dreams, their plans. Uh, it's wonderful. It's contagious, that kind of energy and enthusiasm. And it seems like God has those two favorites in his mind as well because as we saw two weeks ago, the very first person, very first people who learned about the upcoming arrival of the Savior were two very elderly people named Zechariah and Elizabeth. And they were told that they were going to become the parents, as we saw, of the forerunner of the Messiah, John the Baptist. And now today, Angel Gabriel, who's been quite busy, is six months later appearing to another person to let her know that she is going to become the mother of the Messiah. And we're not exactly sure how old Mary was, but common belief among scholars is that she was probably 14 or 15 years old at this time, a teenager. And she was being told that she was going to become the mother of the Messiah. Now, two weeks ago, I spoke specifically to seniors in the congregation, and through the, the example of Zechariah and Elizabeth, I tried to show that we never, we may retire from our jobs, but we never retire from our Christian service. God never puts us out to pasture. He never says, I've got nothing more that I need you to do until he calls us home. And as long as we're in this world, as long as we're breathing, God has a mission and a purpose and a vocation for us. And today, I want to say a special message to teens and to young adults. As you're embarking on your life, I want us together... And the rest of you, you can listen in. It's okay. But this is a special message for teens and for young adults as you embark on your life and determine what it is you're going to give your life to as you embark on this wondrous journey. And, I, and we're going to use Mary as our example through this, little 15-year-old Mary. And this story begins in Luke chapter 1, at verse 26, it starts off this way. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee. Now, we got to stop right there for a, for a moment. It never ceases to amaze me how God seems to pinpoint anything that is despised or disregarded or looked down upon. I mean, many people look down upon seniors, saying that, you know, their best years are behind them. They don't have really much to contribute anymore. They're a drain to society. And what does God do? He chooses Zechariah and Elizabeth to become the parents of the forerunner of the Messiah. And the same way, Nazareth was a despised city. It was located right on the outskirts of Gentile territory. It was looked, as, looked down upon. The inhabitants of it were considered less than the rest of Israel. 
It was, it was also despised by the Romans. It had a long history, and the Romans regarded them with disdain. So they were despised by their own people. They were despised by the Romans. And yet it was in this city that God appeared to a young 15-year-old girl who herself was a peasant, no one of any note or renown, no one who anybody would have looked twice at, it seems that the people to whom the world looks down upon, God seems to pay particular attention to. And so God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, to a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. I want to pause on that word pledged for just a moment because we don't have pledging today. A pledge was kind of like uh, an engagement, but a little bit more serious. If you were pledged to be married to someone and you wanted to break it off, you had to get a divorce. So it was quite serious. And if you had an affair while you were pledged to someone, it was considered adultery. So it wasn't a marriage, but it was more than an engagement. And this young woman, Mary, is pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel said to her, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And I always smile when I read that because I think about just how favored, quote-unquote, she was. If you, were, if you had an angel appear to you, and the angel said to you, the Lord is favoring you. He's looking upon you with great favor. He's with you. What would you think? You'd think, this is wonderful. This is great. God's going to be with me. I'm going to have smooth sailing. Everything's going to be easy. All the decisions I have to make will be easy. This is going to be a wonderful time. How lucky, how fortunate am I? That's our view of what it means to be favored. <laughs> but God has a very different view. The angel says to Mary, you are highly favored. Now let's look for a moment what that meant. It meant that this 15-year-old single woman, girl, was going to have a baby out of wedlock and in her day and culture could mean that she would be stoned to death. It meant that after she gave birth to the baby, the king of her country, Herod, in some fanatical attempt to wipe out her son off the face of the earth, was going to kill scores of children two years old and younger, it meant that she and her fiancé, when the baby was born, were going to have to escape out of Bethlehem, their home country, out of Israel, and live as refugees in a foreign country in order to keep their son alive. It meant that her son, once he had grown up, was going to be crucified as a criminal outside the gates of the city, if this is what it means to be favored by God, it would have been very easy for Mary to say, uh, if you don't mind, I'd just as soon have you favor someone else. And this is what, if you're a teenager, if you're a young adult, I'm going to be challenging you this morning as we go through this message to give your lives over completely to God, to sell out to Him 100%. But before we do that, I want you to understand exactly what it's going to mean. It means the road is not going to be easy. It's not going to be smooth. In fact, there will be struggles and challenges and difficulties and mountains and valleys that you have to go through that may come to the verge of breaking you. It is not easy being a Christian, a believer in today's culture. There are so many things pulling us away, so many things pulling us off the path. 
But God is looking for young men and young women who will say, I don't care what it costs. I don't care how difficult it's going to be. I don't care how challenging it's going to be. I want to follow you no matter where you lead, no matter what it means for my life. And if you're willing to do that, if you're willing to sell out completely, it will be the start of the greatest adventure, the most difficult adventure, but the greatest adventure of your life. I'm going to come back to that, but I want to go on through this passage. It says, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words. Now, she wasn't troubled because she knew the implications of them. She didn't know what it was going to mean. But she was troubled because she thought, I'm nothing. I'm a 15-year-old peasant girl. What can it mean for me? How can he use me? I don't understand. I'm nothing. I have no great gifts. I have no great skills. I have nothing to offer God. But actually, she did. She had a willing heart, as we're going to see. But she felt inadequate, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asks the angel, since I am a virgin? Now you may remember that when the angel appeared to Zechariah, he expressed doubt. He wondered if God could really accomplish what he claimed he could. Mary isn't doing that here. There's no implication that she's doubting. She's wondering, since she's a virgin, how this is going to come about. It seems like a reasonable question. And so she says, how will this be since I am a virgin? The angel answers her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. By the way, just on the aside, I want you to notice here that verse that's up on the screen, verse 35, that whole phrase, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. In the Greek, that's a poem. That's a song. In answer to Mary's question, the angel sings to her or at least recites poetry to her. There's a reason why we have a choir singing every Sunday. There's a reason why we sing hymns out of our hymnal. There's a reason why we have music. There are some truths that can only be expressed poetically, musically. There are some insights that God gives us through music that we cannot comprehend otherwise. And it's why music is such an important part of our Baptist tradition. And I find it wonderful that in answer to a question by Mary, the angel either sings to her or recites poetry to her. And then it goes on in verse 36. The angel says, Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be barren is in her sixth month. Now, I want you to notice verse 37. He says, for nothing is impossible with God. If you are starting out on your life today, if you're envisioning the life that you have for the future, 
however many years or decades it might be, if you get no other truth into your heart and soul, understand this, for nothing is impossible with God. An elderly man and woman, long past childbearing age, can all of a sudden become pregnant and give birth. A 15-year-old virgin can become the mother of the Messiah. The son that she gives birth to can be God taking on human flesh. And this man God, this God man, can die upon a cross but then be raised from the dead. And through this man, God's death and resurrection, eternal life can come to all who turn to him in faith. And this man, God, can then send his Holy Spirit to come into the lives of people who turn to him in faith and transform them into new creations. What is the story, the message of Christmas if it is not that there is nothing impossible with God. Jesus himself said that. He said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And what God is looking for is young men and women who believe that, who are willing to stake their lives on that. And I'm going to, I'm going to speak from my heart to you. If you're, if you're young here today, understand this, that my generation has not always done the best job in showing you that there are no limits to God. And I think the older generation has. I think the seniors have. They've gone through so much in their lives that they've held on to God and they can show us what true faith is like. But my generation, there, there are all kinds of exceptions, but generally speaking, my generation has not done a good job of showing you that we worship and serve a limitless God. And the fear that I have as your pastor is that you're going to look at me and my generation and say, so that's what the Christian life is all about. That's the limit of God. That's what he's all about. And my plea for you is not to look to us if we've not lived out the gospel as we should, to not look to us as the example Look to the generation before us. Look to the faith that they showed as they went through so much in their lives. And understand that God is limitless. His power is limitless. His dreams for your life are limitless. And when a, when a young person, a man or a woman, comes to God, and says, I am giving, I don't know what it's going to mean, I don't know where you're going to lead, I don't know what it's going to result in, but I'm giving my whole life over to you. I'm selling out to you completely. I belong to you. When we do that, God sits up and he takes notice and he will make a plan for your life that will blow your mind. Not an easy one because you'll be highly favored, but a dream that will transform your life. How does Mary respond? She says in verse 38, I am the Lord's servant. You know what the original Greek means? The literal translation means, I am the Lord's slave girl. Fifteen years old. She was facing an un, becoming an unwed mother, 
possibly being stoned to death, rejected by her husband, rejected by her people, rejected by the religious leaders. A life of complete uncertainty. All of her dreams and hopes and plans gone. And what does she say, 15 years old, I am the Lord's slave girl. She is a person that young people today can model themselves after. You may feel inadequate like she did. You may feel unworthy. You may feel, I don't have any real gifts to offer. But when we give ourselves completely to God, he can do amazing things through us. I remember a time, some of you may not realize this, but at one time, I was a teenager. It's true. And when I was 18, I had my very first summer pastorate, south shore of Nova Scotia. I've told this story before. Had my first summer pastorate, and in that summer, I had my very first funeral. And it was really, really hard, especially for an 18-year-old. It was a situation where a 14-year-old shot and killed his 13-year-old cousin. Their parents were sisters. And the 13-year-old who was killed was an only child. The whole family was devastated. I had no idea what I was going to do, how I was going to handle this. I was completely overwhelmed by this, but I knew I had to do something. And uh, so the day for the funeral came, and uh, the young mother, she was in her early 30s, I think it was, or middle 30s, she came in, and she had a man on one side, a man on the other side, and they basically carried her in. And I went through the funeral. I don't know what I said. It doesn't really matter. A couple of days later, I went out to see her, and she was transformed. There was almost a glow over her, and I asked her how she was doing, and she said, well, it's funny you should ask that, Pastor. First time I was ever called Pastor in my life, by the way. She said, you may, you may have noticed that When I came in for the funeral, I was kind of a mess. And she said, I barely knew where I was, but she said, I I sat down in the pew, and the service started, and she said, all of a sudden, this rush of peace overwhelmed me. And she said, it's like you were up there, I was down here, we were the only two people in the church, And these waves of something were flowing over me. And I heard a voice within me say, everything is going to be all right. And she said, the peace that God gave to me has stayed with me. And I realized it was nothing I had said. It was nothing I had done. It was simply the power of God coming in and transforming a life at the worst possible moment in a young mother's life. I'm here to tell you this morning that what the angel said is true. Nothing is impossible with God. Do you realize that the whole Christmas story, every part of it, came about simply because ordinary men and women and young people simply said to God, yes. Mary and, or Zechariah and Elizabeth, they said yes. Mary said yes. The shepherds said yes. The three wise men, or however many there were, they said yes. And I can tell you this morning, if you're, again, if you're a young person, if you enter into your life and you say, yes, God, those two words, yes, Lord, 
And every morning that you wake up, you have to say them over again because it's not just a one-time thing. But if every morning you say, yes, Lord, however hard it is, however challenging, difficult, you may have to go against your family's wishes sometimes. Your friends may wonder what's gotten into you. The plans that you had carefully crafted may all fall apart. But you will look back, I guarantee you this, you'll look back in your life when you're old and you will see that your life mattered. It made a difference. And isn't that what you want? What greater joy is there than to get to the end of your life and look back and say, my life mattered. It made a difference. It changed the world, even if only in a small way. The fact that I walked upon this earth made a difference. And the only way, the only way your life will ever make a difference is if you're used by God, if you believe that nothing is impossible with God. A 15-year-old girl <laughs> becomes the mother of the Messiah. Nothing is impossible with God. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the, the teenagers and for the, the young adults in this congregation. I thank you for their idealism, for their hopes, for their dreams, for their plans. And I pray for each one, Lord, that they might hear your voice speaking within them, hear you calling them out of the crowd, out of mediocrity, out of the ordinary to truly want to do something extraordinary with their lives, to truly make a difference, to have their lives count. Lord, lay your hands upon them. And as you laid your hand upon that young girl named Mary so many years ago, lay your hands upon the young men and women in this congregation and give them whatever inner resources they need to respond unconditionally to the call of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.